This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. First of all, thank you very much for, uh, to the organizers for inviting me, and also thank you for the audience for coming. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, archaic human diets, but I'm going to do this in broad brush strokes, and I want to cover a lot of time. But hopefully, maybe it will be helpful in connecting some of the earlier talks to some of the later ones. For starters, uh, just, just uh, in the interest of full disclosure, human beings are omnivores, and they probably always were. So when we talk about diet, we're not necessarily debating whether they ate meat or not, but trying to look at how these different sources of food, including fungi, are folded into people's lives. And what I'd like to explore here is a little bit about its, its social consequences as well. Because getting food, processing food, is all, all involves labor. It often involves cooperation. And by looking at some of the dietary transitions, we can learn something, we can learn things about the overall changes in the overall fabric of human societies and patterns of human cooperation. Now, so, so meat is, is obviously just one window on ancient human diets. It's an important one in a surprising number of ways. First of all, uh, meat, and especially meat and other tissues from large mammals, are rare in nature. They're relatively uncommon yet they're very high quality and they offer complete protein and in animals that are in good condition, they also, also offer quite a bit of fat to, that can be seasonal. Uh, they're aseasonal in their availability, which means that even when plant productivity may wax and wane in a system, meat does tend to be uniformly, or at least available over the, the full range of the year. And in the case of big animals, even if they're tough to get, they come in really large packages. So it's very difficult for foragers to overlook this. These are, it's just a very interesting property of meat. In addition, there are a lot of interesting social rules wrapped around or associated with the capture of meat as well as the consumption and as well as its, its distribution. So there's a lot we can learn here. Now when it comes to human diets, one way of thinking of them is, is how much is plant and how much is animal. But I'd like to redirect your attention a little bit here to think about something, something else. And that is the cost of getting different kinds of food, the cost of processing them. In other words, the relationship between what you lay out in terms of effort in technology and everything else, fire, whatever, fuel, uh, and what you get for the return. And what you'll see is that there are animals, and there are plants, and there are probably fungi, on, on both sides of the equation. And as many people who have worked with modern foragers can tell us, uh, even though large animals can be difficult to get, when, and, and the supplies can be somewhat uneven or sporadic, uh, the, the return for the effort is very high, or tends to be very high, and thus people uh, continue to do it as much as they can. Uh, but of course, they're also eating lots of uh, other foods that come from the plant world. And uh, if they're abundant, uh, they will tend to be preferred in the sense that as long as all of this is giving a balanced diet, that is, you're getting your vitamin C, you're getting your protein, you're getting your carbohydrates or your fats, that they will prefer, if they're available or, or abundant, foods that are more easily obtained, more easily processed prior to getting them in your mouth, these are what we call higher return uh, or, or higher nutritional return foods for the effort 
that you lay out. On the other side of the equation are all sorts of delicious foods, and we know that uh, many people eat them in the modern era and also in the past. And you'll notice, once again, there are plant products here and there are also animal. By the way, uh, we could probably put honey in the high nutritional uh, yield area, and we could probably put tubers, or at least most tubers here on the right. And what you see are a variety of plant seeds, tubers would be included. Uh, you have to do some work to make them edible. And usually there are technological indicators of this, like milling technology and so on in the archaeological record. But there are also a variety of small animals that are very quick, not so easily gathered. And although people are capable of hand catching them, such as hares, it's a lot of work per uh, animal gained, and therefore the return can be much lower. Now you can overcome these costs or, or this problem technologically, but then you pay the cost in terms of technology instead. So these are, this is an interesting dichotomy. I'm oversimplifying, but, uh, oversimplifying it a little bit, but this is a nice framework for looking at uh, three very important, I think, uh, dietary changes that have happened in prehistory. From somewhere after, or somewhere around a, uh, half a million years ago or a little bit earlier, to uh, the Pleistocene-Holocene transition. Now, uh, these are strictly from a zooarchaeological perspective. And the nice thing about uh, the zooarchaeology is that you're working with bones that have a good probability of being preserved, regardless of whether the animals are quick or slow, large or small. That's the problem with plants, as, as many experts will tell you. OK, first is the ascendance of a top tier predator. Now, this, this doesn't mean that they only eat meat, but it does mean that we have the evolution of a large game hunting species. And uh, we know for sure at this point that uh, this, this characteristic evolved at least 400, probably 500,000 years ago. And it could be earlier. We simply don't know yet. It could be as early as a million. It coincides, by the way, in a very general sense with the emergence of fire and, and uh, ubiquity of fire as a technology. But uh, correlation is not necessarily identifying a causal relation there, although it could be. Second is expanding dietary breadth, and the time interval of, of very special interest I want to focus on is 70 to 50,000 years ago. There may be some earlier cases, but this is when it really concentrates across Africa and Eurasia. And then the third one, which might be a little bit more familiar to some of you in the audience than, than the other two, and that is the domestication of hoofed animals, which we now know occurred uh, by at least 10,500 years ago in the case of sheep and goats, and probably a little bit earlier than that. Most of the evidence, but not all, that I'll be talking about comes from work that I've done, as well as that of close colleagues, including John Speth here. Uh, and I'm going to focus especially on the Mediterranean basin because this is an area with very diverse biota, lots to choose from. And so you can get a sense of what people are choosing to eat and what they're actually ignoring. Large game hunting has very deep roots. And there's a little paradox here in the sense that uh, by 400, 500,000 years ago, people are taking down large bison. They're taking down the, the huge ancestor of, of cattle known as the aurochs and a variety of other hoofed animals. And they're doing it with relatively simple technology, at least simple by our standards. They had uh, very nicely crafted, balanced wooden spears, which are, are nothing to sneeze at. They may have had, in some of the later, uh, after uh, 100,000 years ago, some stone-tipped weapons, but nothing like what we see in, in later prehistory in terms of technological sophistication. This kind of hunting is, is very doable for humans, especially if it's shock and track hunting. Uh, but it involves very close, it requires close cooperation of more than one, one person. And uh, during these periods, because of uh, what we, at least some of us think is a, a pretty high level of carnivory, uh, these would be very small social groups, which means that most of the individuals in the group that are at least able to be mobile are probably helping in some way, not only to act as surrounds in assisting hunting, but also obviously in processing and moving the carcasses to places where they can be processed uh, more thoroughly. I think uh, Maurice Wilson had it right. This is a, a beautiful illustration now, I think, uh, in possession of the British Museum. But it gives you an idea of, of sort of the reconstructions of hunting. 
And uh, we do have an idea of some of the technology, although it's organic. Uh, for example, the case of Schoeningen at 400,000 years ago and the beautiful wooden spears with uh, horse carcasses from there. We don't get lucky, that lucky very often, but it does give us an idea of what that technology would be. So uh, the, in this graphic, the x-axis is time, and actually that, that should go back to 400,000 years ago. I don't know why I didn't take it further back. And the y-axis is just the, the percentage of meat biomass in the diet that comes from big hoofed animals as opposed to any of a variety of small animals. And what you can see is that up to about uh, 50 or 40,000 years ago, 95 to 99 percent of all of the meat biomass is coming from big animals. At least that's what the zoo archaeological record tells us. Something happens after that. Uh, in other words, uh, in the upper Paleolithic and later, some people continue to, to operate in a similar way, at least in terms of animal exploitation, but you're seeing a lot more variation. And in terms of averages, we see a rising proportion of small game animals entering the diet. Now, so we can look at this in a little more detail in terms of costs and benefits and learn something about what is almost certainly a reorganization in human economies. Okay, this brings me to uh, the second trajectory of interest, and this has been called by many the Broad Spectrum Revolution, or BSR, and uh, we find evidence of this. The best evidence so far is coming between 70 and 50,000 years ago for the major transition, or at least a permanent uh, sort of uh, effect. And we see this in the upper Paleolithic of Eurasia from the very beginning, and we see it in the later part of the MSA in Africa. Dates vary. A lot of the small animals that are being added to the diet, some are, some are collectible, they're you know, like ostrich eggs, they're uh, tortoises, things that you can collect pretty easily. But what else is being added in ever higher proportions are small quick animals. Animals such as rabbits, hares, uh, a variety of game birds, squirrels, uh, certain other species as well. And the problem with these animals is that, the quick animals, is that while they're perfectly good meat, in, in, at least in some cases, uh, although they can be lean, is that uh, they are expensive to, to uh, capture. And usually this is absorbed, at least in recent cultures, in terms of technological costs. So we can rank different kinds of small animals, which are fairly similarly sized in terms of the food value fairly similar in fat values, though not entirely. And what we see is that things like tortoises, ostrich eggs, shellfish, at least those that live on surfaces that are not deeply buried in the sand, are cheap. They're not very big, but they're cheap. So they have a high rank. They give a high return relative to the amount of work for the size of the food uh, within the class of small animals. Then we have this other group, which are delicious, but they're more expensive and therefore lower ranked, because in order to really make capture more efficient, you need some kind of technological interface. So by the Upper Paleolithic, and in some phases of the uh, African MSA, we see ever richer mixes of high cost and low cost foods. And this is what we mean by the broad spectrum revolution. And evolving on the, heel of the heels of this it are some very interesting radiations in capture technology. Some of this is organic, they're very difficult to find in the archaeological record, but we do find some elements of it, like diversification in types of points, sizes of points, designs, bone technology, and so on. Now, towards the tail end of this broad spectrum revolution, that is when it's really revving up after the last glacial maximum, and especially after 13,000 years ago, some other things are happening as well. People in some areas, not all, are beginning to settle down. They're beginning to form permanent or at least semi-permanent uh, villages, uh, investing in architecture in a way that we've never seen before. The example here is a Shikla Huyuk in central Turkey, and this dates, these lowermost layers date between 10 and a half and 11,000 uh, years ago. Well, some very interesting things about this. This area is considered, and, and almost certainly is, the heartland for the domestication of wild sheep. Central Anatolia. 
Now, what we're trying to understand in a case like this is what human behavior somehow could lead to reproductive isolation of large herbivores, and in this case, sheep and goats, especially sheep. And we do this a lot of different ways uh, in terms of evidence. One is to look at changes in species importance. And we do see this counterintuitive resurgence of large animal use. We look at herd, herd structure, especially skewing in the age and um, sex structure. And uh, the other thing we're interested in is the extent to which spaces on site are somehow shared with these animals. And what's the evidence there? Well, dumb. Morphological changes are interesting, but that happens long after animals are domesticated. So we don't, we don't need to think about that. Well, here's the story at Ashikla Huyuk, and this is a, a very early case, so I think a good example. And what you can see here is that uh, on the far right, which is the earliest assemblage, um, and these are just percentages, I'm not giving you the total sample or anything, that we have a classic broad spectrum situation there. 28% of all of the animal foods that are coming into the diet are from small animals, and it's all kinds. It's fish, it's hares, it's hedgehogs, it's uh, turtles, and so on. So a complete even mix of, of high and low cost small animals. And sheep and goats are already very important in the diet. They're about 50%. By the, the end of this short sequence, and we're still continuing to work at this site, you see a very different situation. You see that small game is now only 4% of the diet. That very little change, very few changes are occurring in uh, other ungulate species, such as horse and red deer. But sheep and goats are now 75% of the meat input. And another animal that's uh, kind of surprising us, actually, um, is, is aurochs, which is also increasing at that time. We also have uh, skewed age structures, which I'm going to just skip over this pretty quickly. But uh, this kind of skewing in age structures is something you never see in, in hunted animal populations. I've been working on these problems for a long time in the Paleolithic. Never have I seen this. That's evidence of human management. And very quickly, we know from my micromorphological studies that we have in situ dung deposits even at 10,500 years ago and before in between and within buildings. OK, so that's just a quick review of the evidence. Each of these dietary transitions has energetic, social, and coevolutionary aspects. In other words, it isn't just people that are affected. It's, it's the biota around them as well as the landscapes. Energetic ramifications, very quickly. Well, being a top predator means uh, very uh, light, thin populations on landscapes and chronically small group sizes. And, and very high mobility, living very high in the trophic uh, pyramid. Expanding the diet uh, means that you're basically eating more of the things that you used to ignore. And uh, you're, you're taking things that have higher costs in many cases. Now, that's a disadvantage. But there are also some advantages in terms of insurance networks, spreading risk, and uh, a number of other things uh, that, that could be called advantages even a possibly greater efficiency in the sense of an economy of scale, able to support slightly higher human populations on the same amount of territory. There's a, no, there's a social aspect as well. Uh, I'll come back to that in a minute. Animal domestication, well, basically, that is literally managing of meat sources. And it, it's lots of work. It really is lots of work. And it's also uh, probably energetically not all that uh, superior just to a, a hunting and gathering lifestyle unless it is coupled with intensive plant exploitation. The other thing uh, is that meat, in a sense, can be stored. So to finish up then, social ramifications. A united focus, or at least a very he heavy focus, on uh, large game hunting when s groups tend to be very small is that you're always faced with a labor so shortage. And what that may mean socially is that there is a very strong incentive for most members of a group to be in close contact with each other, or at least they can be rounded up very easily, uh, very quickly. And this may, uh, Steve Kuhn and I have speculated, amount to less autonomy for women. With the expansion of the diet, that changes. What you have is an intense cooperation among individuals because at least in, in a short-term basis, or at least at certain age grades, people actually specialize in certain kinds of skills. 
and then they bring these things, uh, the fruits of their, their foraging labor back together uh, in order to uh, gain more, more calories, more energy from the same unit of uh, land area. Animal domestication could very well be a solution for the tragedy of the commons in a world in which populations are increasing and uh, the availability of wild large meat stocks is declining or at least is becoming unbearably unpredictable. This can support higher population densities as I, I noted, but only if, uh, if it's combined with uh, plant use. Meat security is improved this way, but it's no longer coming from a common pool. And it's from this kind of situation that ideas have grown about a burgeoning sense of ownership and autonomy, not at the level of the individual now, but at the level of the corporate group. Okay. So energetics and social changes are closely intertwined in human evolution. Dietary changes definitely affect environmental carrying capacity and human population densities. And finally, humans solve problems by ever more complex solutions, which is probably why it's often, not always, but so often difficult to go back. Thank you very much. So I'll be talking about current hunter-gatherer diets today, um, and in particular I'll be talking about my work among the Hadza hunter-gatherers of Tanzania and East Africa. So the first question that we want to ask is, why study hunter-gatherer diets? So as, as you'll see today, um, there is a wide breadth of data that we'll be covering, and um, I'm responsible for, for um, it's, a, it's a very ambitious thing to try to do is to, to discuss hunter-gatherer diets. So I'm going to do a very brief overview of why we're looking at hunter-gatherer diet composition and then situate it within the context of the, the symposium today. So all humans share a suite of dietary traits that have been retained over millennia of natural selection um, because of their survival value. Now how this is operationalized in different populations um, is very different. So you see a lot of variation which we're going to talk about momentarily. Studying hunter-gatherer diets provide a window by which to view the evolution of the human diet. So hunter-gatherers, I want to say right now before we move forward, um, are not living fossils. They are contemporary modern populations just like you and I. What makes hunter-gatherers interesting and so relevant for discussions like today is that they practice a subsistence regime that has characterized much of human evolutionary history. And the Hadza in particular, who we'll talk about, the population I work with, live in an area of East Africa that has been characterized by many anthropologists as the crucible of human evolution. So this area um, in which our ancestors evolved. So the fact that they're living this nomadic hunting and gathering lifestyle in an area in which our ancestors did, did evolve and are targeting similar food sources means that they can provide a plausible window into the past. Um, now, of course, there are a lot of caveats on this, which we will talk about further, such as many hunter-gatherer populations today are living in marginalized populations, they're living in marginalized areas of their ancestral territory. In addition, as we will see, they're supplementing their diet with traded and purchased foods as well. So again, um, not living fossils, but definitely a allow us to make plausible predictions. And this becomes increasingly important um, as the Paleolithic diet is uh, ever popular, as Dr. Aiello has shown us. So we're still debating on what this Paleolithic diet consists of. Changes in diet um, composition approximately 2.5 million years ago have been linked with the evolution of many uh, hominin traits, so the hallmarks of human evolution, including the sexual division of labor, prosociality, pair bonding, um, and even family formation. So diet is a smoking gun um, in a lot of these scenarios, and it's important when we start thinking about diet composition, and we place so much emphasis on forager diets and what contemporary foragers are eating in this comparative context, to, to think about the breadth and variety. So hunter-gatherer populations from around the world exhibit a wide range of nutritional patterns. So there is no one hunter-gatherer diet, and I think that's one of my take-home messages for today. Uh, they vary according to availability of plant and animal resources. In some coastal areas, you see a lot of fish and shellfish providing significant proportions of the diet, and um, marine resources are um, finally receiving the attention I think that they've deserved. So we're starting to, to really focus more um, on different types of foods rather than 
the, the age-old debate, the, the meat versus potato debate, which we'll get into, so meat versus tubers as um, the foods in human evolution. In many circumpolar environments, you see higher amounts of meat consumption. This, too, is starting to change uh, as we're getting more nuanced data from Arctic foraging populations. And in fact, some very exciting data is coming out of Yupik hunter-gatherers um, in Alaska, who it turns out might actually be fermenting plant foods um, in the bodies of seals and storing this plant food throughout the year to use for later. So even our assumptions about um, how Arctic foragers kind of ruin the, the sample of hunter-gatherers. So you have a lot of subtropical foragers, and then all of a sudden you have Arctic foragers who are eating all sorts of meat, which kind of right, makes, this, makes the story difficult if we're trying to find universals. Turns out they, too, are eating plant food. Um, it just might be hiding in, in the stomachs, uh, stomachs of seals <laughs> um, throughout certain seasons. Um, in many subtropical environments, you have an approximate plant to animal subsistence ratio, which is about 50-50, and in many populations, you actually see higher plant contributions to diet, so more plants being consumed um, than meat products. So you can see modern hunter-gatherers right here are these little peach-colored circles, so not very many populations left, um, and this is the area which we're going to be moving into. So today I'm going to report um, diet composition data for the Hadza foragers of Tanzania. Um, I'm going to do some nutritional chemistry results here. We're going to actually talk about nutrient composition, fat, protein, sugar, fiber, and energy for plant foods. I'll tell you why this is important and why you should care about these in a moment. Um, the percent of contribution to diet by food type, comparison and discussion of some of the big foods, meat, tubers, and honey, and implications for models of the evolution of the hominin diet. So what Hadza dietary reconstruction can tell us about human evolution, what we should take away. I've worked among the Hadza since 2004. Um, diet composition and nutrition in general is one of my research foci. I'm particularly interested in the ways in which food acquisition, foraging behavior, and food distribution um, affect many parameters of social behavior. And I'm interested in the evolution of how all of these things come together to tell the human story. Today we're going to be talking about diet exclusively. Um, and diet is very important because diet has, again, as I said before, been implicated with all of these social behaviors and these changes in human evolution. So let's get a handle on what we're talking about. So first I'll give you a background into the Hadza. The Hadza, um, there's approximately 1,000 individuals who identify as Hadza. Of these 1,000 individuals, approximately 300 hunt and gather. I go back and forth because every year that I go back, the number is declining. So um, this summer, as of this summer, it was a little over 200, um, but we still have many who are practicing hunting and gathering for a substantial portion of their diet. So um, we'll leave the number at 300 for now, but it's on the decline. The data that you'll see today um, were taken from camps in which uh, they were collecting over 90% of their food from, 90% um, of their diet from wild foods. So there are many Hadza that are living in the villages or on the periphery of villages. And they have a, a much more mixed subsistence regime. They live in northern Tanzania on the shores of the alkaline Lake, La Lake Yasi. Camp membership is very fluid and, as we'll see momentarily, really changes, um, changes composition in terms of seasonality. So wet season composition and dry season composition are very different. And this has substantial effects on diet composition. Um, and diet composition, in turn, has substantial effects on social relationships and social arrangement and camp composition during this time. Camp size um, does fluctuate with seasonality, and we'll see that. Here's just a quick, um, a quick view of the field site. So this is Lake Yasi, and the research area that I tend to focus on is on the west side of Lake Yasi, although I have done work on the east side, but today exclusively we'll be talking about camps that are on the east side of the lake. It is just south of the Serengeti National Park, those of you that are familiar with the Serengeti. Um, here's just a quick snapshot of some of the foods, and we'll be talking about each of these in turn today before we get into um, how important they are for the diet. And one thing that I'd like to introduce before we actually get into the methods is that many studies of hunter-gatherer diets have been, um, up until very recently, largely anecdotal. The other issue is that you have um, very different methods being used both in the field and in the lab in order to measure this stuff. So you can have data that's reported in things like calories, kilocalories, kilojoules, um, wet weight kilograms, dry weight kilograms, right, which makes it, as you might imagine, very difficult to do any comparisons across populations. You also have difference in terms of nutritional um, laboratory methodology, so what's happening in the lab as you analyze these foods. 
Um, this is a problem for those of us that are trying to figure out what hunter-gatherer diets can tell us. So what I decided to do is um, go out and collect these foods and bring them back to the Nutritional Ecology Laboratory at Harvard University. And Dr. Rangham, who we'll be hearing from later today, um, and Nancy Lukonklin Britton very graciously allowed me to use the lab to analyze all of these wild foods. Um, no commercial nutrition lab in the US would take the samples when I was doing my dissertation work. So Dr. Rangham said, that's OK, bring them in. Um, and we did, and we found some, some very interesting results that we'll get into. So we're going to be talking about many different berry species, tuber species, which are underground storage organs. I always describe them, um, they often get likened to a potato, but I find that they're much more similar to jicama, um, or even a water chestnut, if that, if that helps, although they're incredibly fibrous. Um, which has interesting implications for microbiota and what's happening with all of the, the gut populations to break this stuff down. Baobab fruit, we'll be talking about honey. Um, figs are also a very important part of the diet, especially for children, um, and legumes and nut species as well. And we'll get into meat, which includes a lot of avian species, which often get overlooked in a lot of dietary reconstruction. Birds are very important for most uh, hunter-gatherer populations, particularly subtropical foragers. So it's important to keep how, uh, birds in mind. So very quickly, going through different food sources, baobab fruit, this is what it looks like when you open it up. Um, it has a hard shell, and inside you have all of these um, very, you have seeds that are covered in kind of a chalky white powder. Baobab fruit is consumed in several different ways. Here we have a picture of a mother pounding baobab seeds. The most common way is to take, this, is to take the innards out, take a pounding rock, pound it into a powder, and then winnow winnow the powder. So what that means is that you have access now to the lipid-rich seed inside. So once you winnow this powder, uh, what happens, they, they, use a, they use a piece of animal hide, is the seed husk floats away. So what you're left with is the fruit powder as well as the powder from the seed. Um, it can also be mixed with berry juice to make um, a Hadza smoothie, which is a really good weaning food. We have several different types um, of berry species. I just have three here, but there are about six species that are routinely consumed. Um, this is on a berry foray. I had one of my friends just show me the, the very small amount that she trotted home with to feed the three hungry mouths that were waiting, and then she came back to get a much bigger yield. Um, several different berry species. And tubers, um, tubers are pretty famous, and they keep showing up in terms of many models of human evolution and, and models of the evolution of the human diet. The Hadza consume four species routinely. They're shown on this slide. And Equa, which is this species right, this species right here, um, is a, a very fibrous species and, and one um, that is, appears a lot in the literature um, as a very important tuber and a very important either staple part of the Hadza diet or a fallback food. There's still a lot of discussion on, on the role of tubers, but what we can agree on is that tubers do make an appearance routinely in a lot of these models, so they deserve our attention. One of the things that makes tubers so interesting is that they can often be buried um, up to four to five feet in the ground. So women, Hadza women tend to forage in groups. Hadza men hunt, uh, typically solo, sometimes in pairs. And um, tubers, as we now know, based on mounting evidence, can be consumed, uh, they can be collected throughout the year, both in the rainy season and in the dry season. And it's, it can be very back-breaking work, as you see here. And I love this photo because this woman has an, a sleeping infant on her back as she's practically uprooting a tree to get to a tuber. So I, don't, I still don't know how she stayed asleep. But here, this is what a typical tuber collection looks like. We will be getting back to the importance of fire, both in this talk and subsequent talks. Um, Hadza women tend to roast their tubers, and they do kind of a flash fire roasting. This is a tuber species called makalita. Um, that's the Hadza word for it. And they, they will roast them uh, typically for just a few minutes before they pull them off the fire to consume them. Honeycomb um, and bee larva. So honey, liquid honey and bee larva are a very important part of the Hadza diet. Honey, interestingly enough, is routinely ranked by men, women, and children as the number one Hadza food item. It ranks above meat. Um, so for many of the models of human evolution that, that place meat kind of as the pinnacle food, it's very interesting that to many foraging populations, honey is actually the number one food that they would like to consume. Um, Hadza men have a very interesting relationship with the honey guide bird, which I think we'll hear more about today from Dr. Rangham. Um, one of my favorite factoids about the honey guide bird is their Latin name is indicator indicator. 
And the Hadza have this great symbiotic relationship with this bird. The bird um, tweets, starts chattering and whistling to the Hadza honey guide, a Hadza honey hunter who's out foraging, and he will then respond back. So there's this series of chatters and whistles that goes back and forth until the bird leads the hunter to the hive. And they then hammer these pegs into the base of the tree. They climb up to the top. They smoke the hive. They hack into it first with an ax, which is very brutal, difficult work, smoke the hive, and then extract the honeycomb. They leave with their prize. And the honey guide bird, um, not to be forgotten, will feast on the wax and the bee carcasses. And they don't always smoke the hive, but they do routinely smoke the hive. Um, Hadza men say only, I, I asked a man during an interview last summer, and he said, well, only the really crazy ones will go after a big hive without smoking it. And this is what a really big hive looks like. So <laughs> um, that's, that's a lot of smoke needed for a very big hive. So you can see we're not talking about small amounts of honey. Um, depending on the region and depending on the season, we're talking about a lot of honey consumption. So it's a very important food. And we can't forget meat. Can't forget meat. Um, meat is also important in the Hadza diet. OK, so let's get into the actual nutritional composition. So I took, I took food samples in the field. Um, I dried them. I took all their measurements. And then I dutifully carried them back to the laboratory um, and analyzed them for nutritional composition. So turns out honey ends up being low in protein and fat. We did not include larvae for permitting issues. Um, we're hoping to be able to um, amend that and collect larvae and actually take it out of the country. Because um, if you think about it, that's a very important component of honeycomb. Um, high in mono and disaccharides. Baobab is high in protein for the flour, um, fat in the seeds and fiber, and low in the mono and disaccharides. Berries are low in fat, relatively low in protein, um, and as we might have predicted, high in both mono and disaccharides. Legumes are high in protein and fiber, low in fat and sugar. And figs are high in fat, fiber, mo and mono and disaccharides, but low in protein. Droops are high in fat and protein, and high in fiber and low in sugar. So what does this mean, once we have all of this information, right? What does this mean? Um, so for many early studies looking at hunter-gatherer diets, what would happen is anthropologists would take measurements of food coming back into camp. So they would look at wet weight. So you would basically measure the weight of the food coming back in, and then you'd get proportionality studies. So you'd say, OK, the weight, we have this much weight of meat versus this much weight of tubers versus this much weight of berries, right? which is interesting in terms of proportionality, um, but not helpful when we're thinking about energetic contribution to the diet. Not helpful when we're thinking about particular uh, both micro and macronutrients. So what we need to do is get energetic value so that we can find out what these foods are telling us. So if you have a kilogram of meat and a kilogram of figs, you're not talking about the same food, right? You're simply reporting weight. So I decided, OK, we need to get in there and actually find, um, find the nutritional value. There were several previous studies done on Hadza diet. And this one was a very, uh, it was, we decided that it actually turned out to be fantastic because we used the new um, methods. And we came up with values that were actually um, kind of right in range of the previous values. So you can see honey, baobab, berries, figs, legumes, and tubers. So what does the Hadza diet look like? So total calories, you can see here. This is what it looks like for the year. And before I wind down, I want to show you what the seasonal differences look like, because this is where it's really interesting and something that often gets left out of many models of human evolution. So if you look at total kilocalories by food type, you see purchased, meat, honey, fruits, nuts, legumes, and tubers. If you go by season, you see we have, in the wet season, a lot more plant matter being consumed as opposed to the dry season, where you have a lot more meat being consumed as everybody, including animals, is hovering around the watering holes, which makes them easier to hunt. So what this means um, for models of human evolution when we're looking at hunter-gatherer diets is we need to be much more inclusive. So we need to start looking at greater dietary breadth. It is not just about meat versus tubers. Um, we also need to include many other different types of foods when we're thinking about this. And this is one take-home message from the Hadza and hunter-gatherer diets in general, is to really pay attention to local ecological variability and what this means in terms of being omnivores. Thank you.
I'm actually a little bit new to this field. This is a little outside of what I've done for most of my research career. So I think I can be a little unbiased when I say that what we know about nutrition and human evolution is a huge scientific success story written largely by the people you're going to hear from here today. We'd like to suggest that there is a missing piece that could be really important. And we think that that missing piece has to do with microbial contributions to host health, nutrition, and evolution. What we're mainly interested in are bacteria, including archaea, viruses, and tiny eukaryotes that are organized into microbiomes or communities of microorganisms living in close association with hosts. And when I talk about hosts, I'm going to be referring uh, really just to primates in this particular talk. Now, what is the problem that we're interested in? Um, undoubtedly, we've all been told that, uh, resist that fiber is really good for us, and that is actually true. Even though resistant fibers are good for us, our bodies actually delegate dealing with them to the gastrointestinal or GI microbiome. So our overall question is how important is the GI microbiome in human evolution? Now this slide should give us a little bit of insight into the problem that we're dealing with. Uh, food enters the intestinal tract um, here and then passes into the small intestine. Now in the small intestine, most of the digestion that occurs is, um, is provided or is, is undertaken by enzymes that our body produces. So the nutrients that we break down and absorb at this part of the gut are largely driven by the machinery that we produce and uh, deploy in, in service of that problem. By the time that food hits the large intestine, what's left are materials that our body really can't do much with. These are primarily resistant fibers and starches. And at this point, we give it over to uh, the microbiome, to the microorganisms, primarily bacteria, that conduct metabolic functions on our uh, behalfs. We're most excited by the fact that this is where our data comes from. Um, down here. Now, uh, we think that microbiomes bring good things to life. Uh, microbes supply about 6 to 10 percent of our daily energy supply. We think this is important, and our models of human evolution and thinking about nutrition need to account for what's probably a pretty substantial uh, proportion of our daily energy supply. They also produce short chain fatty acids. Now, these are extremely important um, energy sources. They actually supply nutrients that are directed um, directly to the intestinal lining. So the cells of the inside of our large intestine don't actually receive a blood supply. They're on the microbes' energetic ledger. So again, thinking about expensive tissues, we're actually removing these particular tissues from our budget. We're extremely interested in the fact that microbes produce hormones and vitamins. And of these, B vitamins might be very, very important, including folate, B6, and B12. And I'll touch on that just a little bit. Um, later, but these are very important vitamins in terms of brain development. They also affect obesity and appetite control. So some of the ideas that we have about fat uh, probably at this point now need to involve the microbiome, uh, gastrointestinal microbiome. This gives a brief overview of what actually happens in the large intestine. As I noted, we're presented with resistant fibers and starches. Uh, microbes uh, begin breaking this down and removing sugars from those substances and then um, conducting a fermentation uh, process here. Now that's what's most important because it produces the short-chain fatty acids. There are secondary products that find their way into being short-chain fatty acids as well, uh, as well as waste products that are produced via this process. So the host has to manage not only production of things that are very, very good for it, it has to, pro it has to process, or the microbiome has to process the waste products from this particular process. And then if everything works the way it should, those uh, substances are passed into the blood supply to assist with host energy balances. Now, why do we think that knowing about microbiomes in human evolution is important? I think we need to, uh, we would argue that uh, we really can't ignore the nutrients that derive from this source. So we know a lot about teeth, we know a lot about um, soft tissues, muscles, and so on. Um, we think it's very important to think about the nutrients that come from this process they may well add up uh, to be quite significant. They also impact many tissues, as is shown here uh, from a recent paper that draws some kind of correlate between um, what happens in the microbiome, the gut microbiome, and other tissues in the body. Experimental results are also very interesting in this regard. This is a fat mouse, in case you can't tell, and this is a not fat mouse over here. Now the main difference between these uh, mice is that they've been implanted with the microbiome from an obese individual, I'll let you guess which one, uh, and a lean individual. 
These are sterile or notobiotic or germ-free mice that have been implanted with microbiomes from human individuals, and you can see a, a rather dramatic phenotypic uh, result from this. Anytime fat's involved, we're interested um, for many reasons, um, and uh, because it suggests something about metabolism and energy balances. The sheer scale of these interactions is also really important to us. There are trillions of microbes in us, on us, and around us at this moment um, conducting uh, a, a range of uh, functions. So the sheer scale alone, we think, makes this interesting in the context of human evolution. Microbial products promote brain growth through the B vitamins that I talked about. They impact longevity because short-chain fatty acids are, in fact, cancer inhibitors. So there may be uh, some link here with longevity. So we are asking whether or not they have brain growth uh, roles or roles in the evolution of longevity. As we'll learn a little bit more today, some of our, our ancestors ate very, very high fiber diets. And so one question that we're very interested in is whether or not our ancestors had to negotiate new relationships um, with microbes or arrangements. There's a possibility that our microbiomes were effectively liberated, or we were liberated from our microbiomes because of the changes that occur when we cook. Finally, we might ask whether or not we were occupied by novel mi microbes that could confer different kinds of advantages to us as hosts. Uh, so what are we doing about all of this? Uh, we're conducting comparative analyses of primate gastrointestinal microbiomes, or what I'll call GI microbiomes. We're analyzing bacterial DNA from fecal samples from both wild and captive primate populations uh, to understand these microbiomes. How are we doing this? Our study breaks into two uh, major parts. The first part is taxonomy, and in, in essence, looking at the structure of the microbiome. What, who's there? What, how is it structured? How are the bacteria in the microbiome related to one another, and do those differ across primate species? We're taking advantage of new, um, uh, very new sequencing technologies that generate um, incredible quantities of data, and we're actually taking advantage of um, 16S uh, RNA molecule, which is very conservative in bacteria and allows us to make statements about bacterial uh, taxonomy, running it through various pipelines to get to the point of st statistics and interpretation. So the first part of our project is really taxonomic. The second part is what's called metagenomic or functional. Here we're trying to figure out what the genes that come with the microbes are actually doing. So we're saying, what's the taxonomy, what's the, what's the structure of the ecosystem, and we're asking, what does that ecosystem um, do? And again, using various sequencing technologies to get to that. What are we finding? We're finding some very interesting results with our cross-species comparison, so I'm going to give kind of a limited view of those um, here today. Uh, one thing we seem to be finding is integration between diets and microbiomes, and the example that I'm showing here uh, is from black howler monkeys or Alouatta pigra. This is an endangered species that occupies the Yucatan Peninsula. The population has been under investigation by Dr. Alejandro Estrada for many years, um, and these results were generated by uh, one of our brilliant graduate students, uh, Ms. Katie Amato. Now, it's slightly complicated, so let me uh, walk you through it. We have different habitats, including a continuous rainforest, a semi-deciduous habitat, a rainforest fragment, and captivity. And what we're finding is that rainforest monkey microbiomes harbor many more microbial species. These are the black, high, and steep lines that you see in the graph, while those in semi-deciduous forests and fragments um, do not. So what we're seeing um, are the, is the quantity of DNA that we're reading. So this is just what we can read from the DNA that's coming out of the sequencing machines. And then we're making a decision about the microbial species that are present. If you have 97% similar sequences, we put you in the same uh, bin. And what we can see is that the rainforest monkeys have many, many more microbial uh, species in their guts, whereas the, the animals that are, are in habitats that are probably not as good have many fewer microbial species in their guts. In fact, in this group, uh, all of the captive animals uh, died, and you might see why in uh, just a minute. Um, we think, therefore, that there are some very important correlations uh, between habitat quality and microbiome that might be very important in primate conservation and may give us some insights into human evolution, because we are fundamentally talking about habitat changes. Let me take another look at this. This is another view of what we were just talking about, our rainforest, our fragments, our semi-deciduous, and then our captives. We could look at this graph as kind of a map of four different cities. Each city has a number of neighborhoods in it, and these neighborhoods are composed of related uh, microbial taxa. So there's a blue 
uh, family group, if you will. There's a, there's a group of related people or microbes living in a neighborhood in each one of these cities. And you can see that in this particular city, we have lots and lots of neighborhoods. Some of these are very densely occupied, and there are close interactions among them. The lines are showing interactions among these microbial taxa. Some are more like the suburbs, where you have very sparsely occupied parts of the city where, where there's not much interaction. As habitat quality, in some ways, goes down, we can see that neighborhoods are entirely lost in the animals that are in a less desirable habitat. And by the time we start looking at the captive habitat, we can see what are probably fundamental changes to that city. Only the most densely populated um, neighborhood remains. Pretty much everything else is gone. We think this could be very important as a tool for understanding the overall health of the microbiome more generally. Let's take a, a brief look at humans in comparative perspective. And I'll go back to what we were talking about, taxonomy and metagenomics here. Now, I'm oversimplifying a lot, um, but what we think we're seeing are some fairly substantial differences between human and non-human primate microbiomes. Here we're looking at something a little different. We're looking at the 50 most common bacterial phyla along the x-axis, and then we're looking at a count um, of how often they're present along the y-axis. And what you can see with the human microbiome, including infants and adults, is kind of a lazy L-shape to that curve. The first three or four bacterial phyla are present in very high abundance, and then it drops off quite, radi quite significantly thereafter, and then becomes quite, quite trivial in the case of infants. And that makes sense. Infants are born uh, uh, with, without microbiomes. They acquire them from the environment. We think that there are some important differences between the human microbiome and the non-human microbiome, and that we don't see that kind of lazy L curve to the, to the non-human primate taxon. Again, this is more complicated than I'm uh, presenting it but it could suggest some fairly important reorganizations of human uh, microbiomes. I hope this slide isn't too complicated, but if anyone has socks that look like this, I want to photograph. This is, these are results that, that tell us about metagenome function or genome function in the microbial populations. Now, the tool that we're using um, gives us information about 28 primary functions. These are two of the functions. These are two of the three most important um, functions that we, uh, that we can identify. So let me walk this through you. What we're saying here is that this blue howler monkey, each bar is an individual animal, the blue howler monkey is conducting uh, probably a little more than 10 percent, maybe 11 percent of the genes that we can pull out of the microbiome are dedicated to protein metabolism. When we drill down into this, what we find is that most of that is, um, is protein biosynthesis. So, what we're saying is that over 10 percent of the genes in the microbes from non-human primates are devoted towards manufacturing protein. As you can see in humans down here, uh, it looks like less than 10 percent of the total genome from the microbes is involved in, in protein biosynthesis. So we think there's a difference between non-human and human primates in terms of uh, actually making uh, proteins. The pattern is um, reversed when we start looking at carbohydrates. And here again, our first blue howler, uh, and then humans, we can see that processes or genes that have something to do with carbohydrate processing are a little less common in uh, non-human primates, but they're more common in humans um, in, in this particular example. And again, we're talking about 28 uh, of general functions here, so uh, if these were allocated simply randomly, we'd be talking about 3 percent gene function. So there, this is a substantial portion, we think, of the microbial genome that's dedicated to um, these particular functions. So let's try to round things out um, and think about what we have. I think we're finding dynamic relations between primates and their gut microbiomes. We can't just take one gut microbiome and put it into all different primate species. There's important variation here that we need uh, to know about, and I think our howler monkeys are saying um, very clearly that this is a dynamic relation. We're actually quite worried about this from a conservation perspective because it looks like when the external habitat starts crashing, so does the internal habitat. And I want to publicly congratulate Ms. Ms. Amato for looking at this and, and having so much to worry about, not only external but internal ecosystems. We think that human microbiomes are distinct um, from those of non-human primate microbiomes. This seems to be the case taxonomically where we don't have microbiomes that are as rich and diverse as those of non-human primate species. And it looks like there are functional differences as well with the human microbiome conducting a little less protein metabolism, but more carbohydrate processing. Now, what are the implications for human evolution? 
I think we can expect that microbiomes change with diets across the course of uh, human uh, evolution. Of course, unfortunately, as far as I can tell, we can't directly get those microbes out, but it's something to think about when we talk about climate change, diet change, and so on and so forth. And the howlers may give us some guidance on that issue as well as other species that we're looking at. at. The taxonomic data seem to be showing some significant reorganization of the human microbiome. We might be thinking about release from protein metabolism. We're asking how important are microbes for brain evolution, and our large-scale comparative analyses will be addressing that. So what are some next steps? We're very interested in documenting additional covariation between microbes, habitats, and primate morphologies, particularly brain sizes. And as our comparative studies develop, we'll be able to look at that more carefully. We're extremely interested in B vitamins, and I haven't talked about those uh, very much here today, but, but we're looking closely at those, particularly in terms of the functional data that we talked about, and we're also interested in looking at protein metabolism versus, um, versus brain size in primates. Uh, I have a lot of people to thank. I'd, again, like to thank Ms. Uh, Amato for uh, excellent work, as well as our postdoc, Carl Yeoman, um, who has been a remarkable part of this project, as well as a number of collaborators and the National Science Foundation. Thank you very much. Thank you.